Are people hearing me? Uh, yeah. Go on, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, my understanding is that you've done some reading about epistemic injustice already, and that um, my chapter on gender and the fat body was like an optional reading, but not necessarily something that everybody's done. Is that right? Okay. Um, out of curiosity, either way is fine. People who are in the room have read it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Again, if you have time, but um, but I just wanted to to see how much to repeat and how much not to repeat. So, uh, cool. So, I want to go through a couple of different ways that epistemic problems can arise that impact trans people who are seeking healthcare, um, both about transition related care and about general care, and kind of give us an opportunity to explore this together so we can think about kind of what are the philosophical moving parts that are happening here. And I hope that eventually more people will be thinking about this, especially in the healthcare field than are currently doing it. So I'm really excited to get to have this conversation with philosophy brains, um, because often I'm having to like sneak theory in like vegetables into the pasta, you know? I'm like, no, we're not talking about this. <laughs> nope. <laughs> We're talking about thumbs, uh, simple stuff. Um, the, the medical field is just terrified of theory, completely terrified of theory. But it's so fun, it's so, it's so tasty. So, the first question I want us to dig into is how do you know? How do you know that that's your gender? This is a question that trans people get asked a lot that cis people almost never get asked. And part of the reason that it's difficult for trans people to answer that question is because there isn't a normal conversation around it. There aren't a lot of heuristic models for answering the question, how do you know your gender is happening the way you describe? And so it's as if you're asking somebody something like, well, what do you mean it sounds loud? How do you know that it's loud? Well, I know because it's loud. Well, yeah, but like, in what sense is it loud? If you needed to explain to somebody who's never considered loudness, what it was like to be in a room that was too loud, you would go, well, like, it, it feels wrong in my ears, but I'm also feeling it in kind of my rib cage, right? It's like, it's too, it's too loud, and I don't like it. You would really just be saying, it's too loud. It feels like it's too loud. It just, it's just like, it's just loud. And if you need to convince somebody that you knew what loud was, you probably couldn't. And it's really that same thing where people are asked to sit down. Um, I knew a medical provider in my, in my neighborhood, in my context, who, if he had doubts about somebody's gender being authentic, which is already fucked up, the thing he would do was assign them an essay to write about what their gender is and what it means to them. And if you are cisgender, and a thing that you could do to like see what that would be like is next time you've got some time after you graduate, whenever, sit down and like try to write two pages about what, what it is to be a man. Um, and try to fill those two pages. And then imagine that you can't get medicine until you do it. So we have these moments where the, the challenge to create something that is in one of these hermeneutic lacunae is really explicit. And I think that that gives us a really kind of, on the philosophy side, a really beautiful opportunity to see and understand this phenomenon. Of like what what is it like for somebody to look at another person and say there's no language for this in our normal cultural context but if you don't find the language in the next five minutes i don't believe you um and that's wild and yet this is not the only example of course this is just a really clear example of how this works another way that the how do they know topic came up um when i was an undergrad uh, I studied sociology, and I was sitting with a professor in office hours, which by the way, do that, um, I didn't understand how important that was until after undergrad, but do that as much as you can. Um, but I was chatting with this professor and talking about my research interests and said that I was interested in trans topics. 
And my professor said, do you know that there are gay trans men? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. Uh, I was yes. like, you know, as it happens, six or eight of my best friends are gay trans men. And he leans over to me and he says, how do they know? And I, I said, um, sir, a lot of men in my generation center their experience of masculinity in ways that are unrelated to sexually dominating women. I swear to God, this man goes good for them. <laughs> Because his entire understanding of what it was to be a man was to be in a heterosexual dynamic with a woman. And so for him, the idea of not desiring a heterosexual power dynamic with women was like, well, what else is there? It was like, sometimes you just want to wear pants, my dear. And like, it's okay. So... <laughs> And he wasn't even embarrassed. I think he, I think he should have been, but he wasn't. He was just like, oh, huh, that is a wildly different concept of gender than I have. So like, what is it, what is it to be a man? Um, but that guy also couldn't have answered that question. That came up discursively, but it could not have come up if somebody had said, what is being a man? And even if he had thought about it before, he probably wouldn't have said, it's being in a power dynamic with a woman. So we have these, all of these like implicit definitions that are operating on a totally unrecognized level, but that are creating these questions like, how did they know? And all Um, and is that really the best that we've got? Um, how can we be? How can we be making some other choices? So the question of like, how do we detect gender in ourselves? How do we experience gender? I think is a question that is increasingly not always asked in a defensive moment in that gatekeeping moment and is, is more a question of like well what if we just have this question because it's interesting um what if we start it's coming through my mic for some reason just oh okay cool um yeah uh so how 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 do we know um and how can we be asking like how do you know what your gender is in a situation uh, where somebody's not holding over you some kind of intense power uh, for you to create that, that particular answer. And I think also when we're in that less coercive environment, we get to have better answers because the priority is not ending the coercion and getting what we need out of the encounter. So um, Julia Serrano uh, wrote Whipping Girl. This is often considered gray lit, but I think um, that's because of uh, academic like elitism and it's gray lit because she doesn't have a PhD, you know? Um, this is a really phenomenal book for talking specifically about experiences of trans women and especially white trans women. So she is writing from, um, from a trans woman perspective uh, on sex sexism and scapegoating femininity. And I think sometimes when she talks about trans men, her, uh, her analysis is not as strong, but I think her analysis in terms of how uh, stereotypes of trans women create experiences for trans women and also for cis women is really powerful. So I recommend that. Um, and so she's talking a lot about how like the image of the trans woman putting makeup on is a controlling image for trans women. Um, this idea of artifice as being at the heart of trans femininity, the idea that 
what is essential about trans femininity is the performance and the, um, the adoption of, of these artificial demonstrations of femininity of, and, and putting on makeup is really the, the image. And she talks about how for probably decades, anytime trans people were mentioned on the news, any kind of like even sympathetic coverage, there was B-roll footage of the woman or a woman putting on makeup. And that was so solidly associated with, um, with trans women. And I think that also around the same era, and I can't remember if she mentions it or not, um, images of sex work are also almost as strongly associated with trans femininity, and particularly when you're not talking about white trans women. So you have these images, and it's not like there is anything wrong with makeup or sex work, but the assumption that what it is to be a trans woman is to be artificial and engaged in particular forms of labor that people often describe as selling a human body, that creates a highly objectified view of trans women. And so, um, so I think it's really valuable to look at like who is creating the heuristics that are available. And one of the things that Serrano talks about really, really powerfully in Whipping Girl is um, the lack of availability of relatable images of trans women when she was growing up. That the only place that she saw trans women on TV were on like the Mari show where there was some highly contentious and, and negative stereotype image of a woman generally revealing to her partner that she was trans and then the partner is gonna be mad about it and it's all completely over the top and that's, that's the story. That is the one and only time that you get to see a trans woman. Or as kind of the same the same stereotype of that like dishonest reveal trope um, where the point is a more central character is discussed. Uh, like Ace Ventura um, is maybe the big, the big one. Um, this gets talked a lot about, uh, talked about a lot in um, the Netflix uh, representation special. So that's a good, um, a good thing if you're curious about sort of more about that trope. But that creates not just stereotypes about trans women or cis people who are watching them, but it also creates a barrier to recognition of self for trans women. And so that's what Serrano is talking about, where she had trouble and many trans women had trouble recognizing themselves in trans women that they were avail uh, able to, to perceive in society because the versions were so distorted that there wasn't enough to actually relate to. That they couldn't say, oh, that's me because they were shown this monsterized character and no, almost nobody would be able to, to see themselves in the distortion that they were shown. And a lot of trans masculine people um, writing before the like trans, trans tipping point of like the mid 2010s, talked about how there were no heuristics available for trans men, that they were completely unaware that this was a thing, sort of aware that trans women existed, but absolutely not aware that trans men existed, absolutely not aware that non-binary people existed. And I've seen a number of reports from trans men who the very first time they saw a depiction of a trans male body it just, they were like, oh, I'm that. I'm that, that's what's happening. I am that. Um, okay, I now I have this information and off I go. And it's this moment of potentially just revolutionary shift where this heuristic suddenly becomes available and the person has everything they need to put into that framework, but they just have no framework at all to put it, to put it into. And so it just sort of slots in immediately and they just go, aha, well, here, here we go. Um, and I think it's really important to think of this as heuristic injustice because that person has been 
kept from knowing the whole rest of their life that trans people exist. Whether that is not knowing that trans women exist as real human people who have things in common with anyone else and are not just this incredibly narrow, unrealistic stereotype, or that trans men, that non-binary people exist at all, that this is a thing. And so the absence of these heuristics create a situation in which people have no way to relate to the information, the perceptions they have about themselves. Um, so imagine if you were having the feeling of bass vibrating through your rib cage and your ears prickling, but you have never heard of loud. How would you explain that? And the second somebody told you what loud was, you'd be like, oh, I know about loud. I know about loud. Loud is a thing I know. But how could you explain it before that? So we've got these public heuristics that either exist or don't exist or exist in these very narrow ways or exist in ways that are more full and relatable and sympathetic. And that doesn't happen in an, at random. Um, and often I think public discourses around these kind of controlling images and around stereotypes particularly focus on the role of sort of an amorphous public that is like people do stereotypes and that's bad. Or it's like the media does stereotypes and that's bad. And I think it's really important to both think about what we're doing just as individual people in our lives and also think about like how is the media influencing public thought and conversation. But there's this place that we don't talk about and it is the university. The university is a knowledge creating institution. Its job is to influence and direct and control how we think about the world. And it does that and it has been doing it and it does it really well. And a lot of the ideas that we have about what trans women are like come out of the university. A lot of the ideas that we have about whether or not non-binary people exist at all are formalized university projects. And that is both positive and negative in the sense of creating knowledge and blocking knowledge and destroying knowledge. And we know that often this happens by welcoming and not welcoming, allowing and not allowing particular scholars and also particular lines of thought and also funding things separate, <laughs> differently, making things available. Um, a lot of the developmental ideas about how gender works in the United States and how the gender is how gender is embodied in the United States was financially uh, influenced by the eugenics movement. And so what we know scientifically about gender for the last hundred years has been influenced by what Nazis like to say about gender. And that's a conversation that many doctors have never had. And so when they think about how, for instance, uh, sex and gender differences were taught, probably they were only taught in biology. They were only taught in the section on genetics. And within the section on genetics, they were only taught in a section on deviance. They were taught about problems, genetic problems. The reason that they were taught for example, that intersex people exist literally only in the context of genetic problems is because eugenicists worked very hard to prioritize getting it into the curriculum at the high school and college level. They funded a lot of the early chairs in uh, the studies of genetics, and they are the reason that that's how we learn about this, we still learn about this. And probably none of our high school biology teachers know that that's why it's in the book, but they're still going to teach it in that unit because it's always taught in that unit. So when we don't think about the cycles of how this knowledge is created and reproduced, then we, we just stay in that same place. And the 
um, the wrong body uh, model. I know you talked a little bit about that. It's a historically specific idea, right? This arises as a way of negotiating within the rise of genetics and the rise of eugenics. The born in the wrong body model comes into um, its earliest forms, the beginning of the 20th century before World War II, largely in Germany. And so you've got uh, sexologists in pre Nazi and then Nazi Germany who are working within the frameworks of their time and place. And the wrong body idea came out of a previous idea that was more spiritual in, in its framework. The idea was, um, I have a male body, but a woman's soul. But after about the 1910s, you couldn't really write medical papers with souls in them anymore. And so it wasn't, uh, a woman's soul, but uh, an incorrect body. There had to be a problem there. Uh, and it was specifically men's bodies and women's souls because it was men writing. And so you could have the epistemic space for a man to say, ah, I think I have a woman's soul, but there wasn't epistemic space, conversely, for a woman to say, aha, I have a man's soul. And with the testimonial injustice, not just of who gets to be writing medical papers in the first place, but also who gets to claim what, there is sometimes more space for people to claim down in a power dynamic than claim up. Because a lot of people who were assigned female and then lived as men are ignored as possibly having any gender expectations. Because, yeah, why wouldn't you want to be a man? Like, why wouldn't you? That checks out. And the idea is it is so natural to want to be a man and for a woman to prefer manhood because of status and because of um, all of the power that comes with it, and because of the assumptions that women are worse and, and less. That a woman who presents as a man or a man who might have been assigned female is treated as really the same thing. And there's not any, <laughs> there's almost not even a question of whether there's an internal motivation there because it's considered to be overdetermined. So there's, there's lots of different um, imbalance uh, in terms of like who gets to know what and then on top of that, who gets to know what about their bodies is, of course, further limited and further dictated by how else you are devalued as a knower. Um, and this is very obviously racialized. Um, if you haven't read The Undercommons, um, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, I recommend this for absolutely everyone who spends time in a university. Um, Yeah. Um, and this, this talks a lot about how the university functions as a military operation uh, to invade both literal and figurative space and bring things under the power of the university by incorporating it into university structures. Absolutely wonderful. Um, and it encourages and really demands uh, a criminal relationship with the university and makes the claim that this is the only ethical relationship that a person can have with the university. So um, I love this book. I give it to like all of my mentees when they graduate usually. Uh, but another very common category of people who don't get to have the status of knowing things about their bodies is fat people. And so if you think about somebody who is already fat, already black, and then making the claim that they're trans, that claim has very little weight. So uh, Victor Donarski, who is one of the authors that um, I 
analyzed in the chapter that's on the yeah it's up on canvas on canvas in the epistemic injustice section excellent um talks about the first time they went to a doctor to try to access transition related health care services their doctor said are you sure you're not just a fat lesbian because the doctor's perception was that Dynarski's discomfort with their body just made sense. That like somebody who looked like them would obviously feel uncomfortable with their body. And so the doctor put together gender nonconformity. So, you know, lesbian and fat and probably was stereotyping lesbians in that way as well. And said, ah, this is this is the explanation. And the patient is sitting there saying, I don't like girls though. I think that that's a prerequisite. <laughs> I think lesbians have to like girls. <laughs> like, no, I'm gay, but I'm the okay. Um, and so the idea of like fat people get to know what their gender is uh, is not really a thing. Um, I also really, uh, sorry, the author has changed their name since the first time I cited them and I'm making sure that I have it right in my head. Um, Hunter Ashley Shackelford um, talks about being black and non-binary and having to fight for black womanhood as a non-woman um, who grew up fat and I really, really recommend that piece. Um, their work is super uh, accessible. They put a lot of stuff on Medium. So um, yeah. Uh, and the the piece that I cite in my work is why I don't use they, them pronouns, but they do use they, them pronouns now. So if you hear me saying they, them, and then go see that piece, that's exchange. So. Um, so yeah, they, they talk a lot about how um, womanhood is defined through whiteness and through thinness. And you see that a lot as well in discourses within um, non-binary people, particularly I think younger non-binary people, that there's this idea that the only non-binary person who actually exists is like a 15 year old, 80 pound white person who was assigned female at birth who is visually androgynous, and that is the whole story. And so Black non-binary people and fat non-binary people and non-binary people over the age of 40 and non-binary people who have facial hair and non-binary people who have hips are all sort of outside of this really tiny stereotype. And then there's also a lot of people who are saying there should not be a single stereotype for non-binary people, regardless of whether it's accurate, because you are not understanding what non-binary is if you are trying to make one single picture of it. So um, how are we doing on time? Is Good, we're fine. Okay. Uh, we have about 45 minutes left. Gorgeous, okay. okay. Um, I wanted to make sure that I'm sort of getting through a, an outline and then leaving lots of space to discuss. So, um, yeah, so thinking about where are these kind of controlling images come from. Um, Aberrations in Black, uh, Roderick A. Ferguson, if you want the yeah, spelling. Um, This book talks a lot about how images of gay identity and also trans femininity or drag images. There's a lot of like blurred lines because it's talking a lot about like the 50s and the post World War II era. And so we, we don't have the kind of solid lines that we have since. Um, but it's talking about how a lot of US homophobia and transphobia emerges directly out of anxieties that like jazz clubs are sites where you have like interracial relationships and people might be talking about communism 
and um, girls are boys and boys are girls and all of the lines are breaking down and maybe it'll end society as we know it. And the idea that transphobia is essentially rooted in nationalist anxieties about keeping color lines solid is not something that I think is really available to most people. It's really valuable to look at the role of the Chicago School sociologists in defining how the academia thinks about the black drag queen. Because it was that anxious sociologist who was like, I don't like who's in this room. I don't like one room with all of these different people in it. I don't like what might be happening in this club. That's the person who's writing the dissertation that defines the public awareness of what black drag is. And it's that person who has a personal anxious interest in upholding white supremacist normalcy, who's helping the rest of America know what to think about a black drag queen. And so if we don't think through, like why was this, why was this particular um, framework privileged? Why was this, you know, what was the, the impact within the university and thus outside of it? Why did this get to define it for everybody? And I think that as the university wants to look really progressive, they don't wanna talk about it. <laughs> for sure they don't wanna talk about it in sociology that a lot of the ideas that we have about how race works comes from sociology. Not, not the like cool ones, but like <laughs> the worst ones before that. Like there are awesome critical race theory sociologists and there's a lot of anti-racist sociologists now. And I'm sure there were before, but like if you read eugenics texts from 1920 and before, they were so jazzed about their sociologist friends and they were like, sociology is the, the queen of sciences and it will pull us all into society, into the perfect uh, white utopia. Like they had all of their eggs in the sociology basket and that's not at random. And so we have to look at like, what was sociology doing to create these controlling images? Not from a place of like, oh, offensive cartoons, but like, the books that people were reading and teaching that were the basis for K through 12 teaching, that were the basis for policy, that were the basis of like the people who thought of themselves as being very smart and careful and informed and who probably were very careful and I guess informed kind of. But so we have to think through like how those power structures are creating the available for six. And I think personally, the university needs to be much more solidly centered in that criticism than it has been to date. So now that we've got this system where we've got decades of anxious white centered observations about deviancy shaping how we're thinking about trans people, but we've also got this like 20th century enthusiasm about better living through science. We have some like tension where starting in around the same time as the rise of the eugenics movement, we also had the rise of like starting to make synthetic hormones. And from the very beginning of synthetic hormones, people were using them to transition. And there were transition surgeries from around the time of World War II. Not nearly as many as we have now, it wasn't nearly as available, but this has been going on. And so after World War II, you have this tension between wanting to um, uphold the, the white normal and also wanting to enjoy through science control over bodies and control over um, society. And that impulse, which was very present in the eugenics movement, absolutely is carrying through like the 50s. And so we're seeing things like the heavily drugged housewife. Um, and we're also seeing some 
expansions of uh, gender specific clinics in the United States during that time. But we're also seeing it within a really specifically controlled frame that follows these heuristics. And so you see things like in order to transition medically, um, a woman must be able to explain what it is to be a woman and pass that sort of testimonial barrier and then has to live full time stealth uh, for a year, stealth meaning um, that no one can know that she's trans um, for a year, two years without having any access to hormones or surgery. So has to be able to pass instantly, uh, has to be able to get a job, has to be able to um, have prospects for a heterosexual marriage. And it is important that she is heterosexual because if she's not heterosexual, she may not transition. It is at that point medically uh, categorized as a separate thing and a, a fetish and a problem and it's, it's a different thing. So we have this incredibly strict and difficult series of, uh, of hoops that people have to jump through. And I'm talking about women specifically because that was what was the focus for a lot of these clinics and a lot of these, um, these programs. And for a lot of the public panic about it as well. So that was what was under the microscope um, on kind of every level. And so you had women helping each other to get through the hoops and said, okay, this is it. This is, this is what we have to do in order to get this. If you want to get this, we will tell you, we will like give you the cheat codes. We will help you tell, like know exactly what to say, exactly what to do, who can help you. And that might've meant like getting hormones on the black market in order to pass that real life test in order to get that job, in order to be able to get it um, on uh, officially. It might look like, it often actually looked like trans people reading medical journals and case studies about trans people, looking at what was published where people said, this is a real case, this is a fake case, and then repeating whatever it said in the real case. So you had decades and decades and decades of people repeating the stories that they got out of medical journals to their doctors in order to get through the process. And then every time there were more case reports, it all said, wow, these are incredibly consistent. Can you believe how consistent these stories are? And that meant that anybody who didn't have access to that secret knowledge couldn't get through it because they looked so weird. And so you had people who were saying like, oh no, me, totally heterosexual. Also, I knew from the time I was three, I don't know why, but I just always felt different from the other boys. I liked pink and it was the script. And whether or not the script was true was just not relevant. The doctors were so upset when they found out. But the thing that they concluded because of the hostility that they already had towards trans women was trans women are liars. And so then they wanted to make sure that they had the specificity to catch the trans women out in their lies. And so they started doing things like, write me an essay. Two whole page, I don't wanna hear the 30 second version. I wanna hear details. I want you to tell me deep personal stories about that time that your mom caught you wearing her shoes. And it was still the same trope. It was still the same stereotype and it was still people doing what they needed to do to get through it. And it created this mutual distrust and hostility that was absolutely grounded in surveillance in the first place and that we have still not come out of. So when we think about the professionalization of knowledge, what that means is that that knowledge is entering the university, captured by the university, held by the university, and not allowed to leave again. And I'm sure all of you have noticed that the discourse moves much faster on social media than it moves in the classroom. And you are very frequently hearing things that are smart and informed 
and nuanced and very up to date and very in touch with current events from your peers. And then you're going into a classroom or you're opening a published work and you're like, I mean, this is fine. But like we were saying this five years ago and that is part of how the system works. And it's gonna take even longer to get from there into like clinical trainings. And then it's gonna take like six clinical trainings before the doctor like remembers it. And then by the time that person's behavior shifts or the system shifts, whatever they've just adopted is so out of date that somebody's gonna yell at them and they're gonna be like, I'm trying so hard. And so we still have the same epistemic relationship that is so dysfunctional. And I think part of it has to be because we have this assumption that if we hurt other people in a clinic, it is because of ignorance. And if we just learned more stuff, we would be able to not hurt each other. And that is itself a white supremacist belief about how knowledge makes you perfect. We don't actually have to understand how other people experience gender to not be assholes. Like we can just learn what it is to not be an asshole and then do that. And it is an intimidatingly gorgeous mystery that other people have experiences we can never possibly comprehend on any even vague level. But we don't have to be able to do that to just understand what they're asking for in the end. And I think in order to move away from this epistemically dysfunctional relationship within the medical field, we have to challenge that underlying idea that if we just know enough stuff, we will never mess up again. So I think that is at its heart, not gonna help. And then compounding that, trying to make sure that we have the correct information by privileging the slowest moving knowledge production sources that structurally exclude the kind of people that we are hurting by hurting them in those ways is never gonna be the solution. So I'm currently working on a series of provider education materials um, for the University of California. And I told them that they're only allowed to use them for five years. This is very inefficient. They are going to be paying a lot for these materials and they would rather use them for 20 years. And they are not allowed to do that. I am choosing to appear on camera in highly dated clothing. Like I'm gonna be wearing fast fashion <sighs> so that when somebody opens the thing, if they open the thing and it's 2030, they're gonna look at me and be like, are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> I have not seen that haircut in a minute. And I want that because I don't want, I don't want it to be a classic, you know, suit could be from any time, no. I want, I want popping graphics. I want slang. I want fashion. I want somebody who's even a little bit aware to be like, I don't, I don't, I don't, this feels a little old. <laughs> because I want people to notice if, if it's been too long. And it sh it, it, we don't, we're not good at that. We're not good at that. In my clinical program, I was taught about bisexuals from the 80s. And what I was taught is that bisexuals remain confused over the life course. And that is not, that's not a good thing to be teaching therapists in 2020. I mean, it wasn't good in the 80s either, but like, we, we just can't, we just can't do that. And somebody could have spent like literally one second on like bi.org, you know, and not made that mistake. But because they privileged, like what is the highest selling book on bisexuality that's ever been written in this field? They got to the one from the eighties that was the first use of bisexual in an academic press or whatever it was. 
And so they're like, ah, oh, this is foundational to the field. And it's like, who cares? <laughs> is that person even by? Probably not. So thinking through all of those like implications of knowledge professionalization, the last one that I kind of want to highlight is once we've got this idea that the problem is with that we don't know enough and we haven't studied enough and we just have to do so much homework to not be problematic. And so we need to like go to the classes and, and take the seminars and study and do the work. Then we end up having all of these people who are like, well, I haven't done enough work to fully understand this. So I can't get involved. We end up with the idea that the knowledge is specialized and inaccessible. And then we get things in the medical field like trans broken arm syndrome. Trans broken arm syndrome is where a trans person needs healthcare that is totally unrelated to their gender or their transition. And they can't get it because the person says, oh, you need to see an endocrinologist. Um, I don't know what the implications of treating a trans person for X condition are. And a lot of healthcare providers that I've trained have been genuinely surprised to hear that A, people who medically transition are not stuck in the moment of looking for hormones for the first time for the rest of their life. Like that is a particular moment that is very, very, very salient to medical professionals. But it's like, that is actually not the only health need that even people who medically transition have. But beyond that, that like lots of trans health needs have nothing to do with being trans at all. And where the only relevant thing is like call people by their correct name and pronoun. Do not disclose that they're trans if you don't have to. Don't look at parts of their body that you don't need to for medical reasons. Like that's, that's it. <laughs> but you'll have people who are like, well, I don't know how to do dental work on a trans person. And it's like, you do. It's still, <laughs> it's just teeth. The thing you need to do to do transfer, and tr listen, transfer and dental work is a major, major need. We need it. We need dentists to go get educated on trans topics, but it's not dentistry. They misgender people a lot. Because in dentistry, you've got three people talking about the patient next to their head. And so it's really common to misgender people and really weird to be the person who's like, hey, can you like not misgender me? But also I know you're about to put a power tool in my face, so I don't want to offend you. So like, that's all that a dentist needs. It changes nothing about the bones. Um, but often you'll have things where people will say like, I don't know, I don't know if I can give you birth control because you're trans. And I don't even know what that means. And there's this sense of like helplessness um, where people have convinced themselves that the knowledge is so complicated and so, uh, so specialized. And maybe they've seen experts be brought in because something happened, right? And then you bring in an expert and then the expert's gonna help you handle it. And part of that kind of communicates to people like, you couldn't take care of this on your own. This is only for experts. When really it was like, we brought in an expert because none of you have handled this yet, but you could. And so you have this sense of like, as that knowledge gets sort of status or gets more entangled with university power structures, you have this sense of helplessness toward trying to actually be responsible to those kind of knowledge needs because like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not trained in that. And that is especially problematic when we look at that in the context of that, how do they know kind of gender validation attempt that medical professionals are often asked to do. So in the United States right now, for most people who get gender affirming surgery and get their insurance to pay for it, they require one or two letters from um, a mental health professional saying that, that it is appropriate for them to have this because they have gender dysphoria. So 
if somebody wants, um, generally speaking, a chest reconstruction takes one letter and genital reconstruction takes two letters, but that varies. So if somebody wants a genital reconstruction, they have to go to two different therapists within the same year. And often those therapists will both want to see them for at least three months. And the therapist is basically told that their job is to evaluate what the patient's actual gender is. And so you'll have some people who have really terrible gender ideologies who are very confident that they can act adequately assess somebody else's gender. And those people will do things like, go write me a five page essay about what being a man is. You've got people who are like, I don't know anything about any of this and I'm not interested. And then you've got these people who are like, as an ally, I don't want to step outside of my expertise. And because I don't know how to assess another person's gender, I can't write you a letter. And it's like, okay, nobody knows how to assess another person's gender. That's not a real skill. But we've got people who won't do a thing that needs to be done in order to just get through the process because it's not real. And it's like, no, it's never been real. It was never real. At no point was, was the, <laughs> like, it's been fake the whole time. <laughs> the whole time? Yeah. The whole time. <laughs> um, Sorry. And so I, sometimes when I, when I train uh, mental health providers, I have to be like, no, it's fake. Listen, it's fake. You just do it anyway. And if that feels morally uncomfortable, good <laughs> fight someone about it but like not the patient okay um and trans people are like structurally underemployed structurally underinsured and if you think that you can get your insurance to cover two different therapists at the same time you're wrong uh you can't you can't do that so if you happen to be for instance a student and you happen to go to a school where your uh, campus providers will write a letter, which is unusual, then you might be able to just sort of do the thing. But if you're trying to get into like getting through a wait list to see a therapist who's covered by your insurance, then getting through another wait list to see another therapist, hoping that both of them will say yes, hoping that you'll get both of the letters. Also, I don't know if I mentioned this, the letters are only good for 12 months. It's a bad plan. <laughs> like it's just, it's just bad. Um, and it all centers on these epistemic, um, like squid games, um, <laughs> that have been set up around like trying to preserve the white heterosexual family unit of the nineteen fifties. And it's like, what if I didn't actually like epistemic squid games? <laughs> I'm gonna raise intelligibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, well, what, the thing is, if you want to go be a physician or a surgeon or a, um, a mental health provider, and you do not value um, 1950s era concepts of white heterosexual normalcy in your practice, uh, it doesn't matter because you, it, it's, it's still required. Um, and this epistemic verification process is almost completely unique to trans medicine. If you are 19 years old and you want to have a gender affirming surgery that aligns with the gender that you were assigned, you do not need this letter. Regardless, um, also the letter isn't just what your gender is. Um, a letter will typically say, I have been seeing a patient for X amount of time. Um, that person has consistently presented with this gender. Uh, often if your patient is, is uh, non-binary, they will choose to consistently presented with a binary gender in order to get past the insurance people. 
Because by the way, this letter is read by somebody with a high school education who has no specialization in medicine or trans identity. Um, all insurance pre-certification letters are read by just like random people who are like pulled in off the street, basically. Like the people who make decisions about whether we get healthcare have no expertise in healthcare and that don't care about us and never will. And they're making the decision in about five minutes. So the letter could also get rejected and then you have to send another one or send, send it again and hope that you just get a different person. So whole long process. But the letter will say, the person has consistently presented with this gender. If your patient is gender fluid, they have to lie or they can't get their care. If your patient is non-binary, they might have to lie. If the person has chosen not to transition socially because they want to transition medically first, uh, sometimes you'll lie. Um, if the person is currently detransitioned because during the pandemic they needed to move back in with their abusive parents and their parents don't know that they're trans, but they know that they're going to be able to move out when they go to grad school. Uh, you're not going to tell the insurance company that. You're going to be like, yeah, no, totally consistent. Everything's fine here. So you have all of, like, there's so many reasons that people's gender could look different ways than what the insurance company expects. The insurance company doesn't know that and also doesn't care. But again, you have to know how to say the thing that the insurance company wants to hear in order to get the letter approved. You also have to say that if there are any other mental health problems, and yes, other, because you have to diagnose them with gender dysphoria, regardless of whether or not they have gender dysphoria, because it won't be covered by insurance if they don't. But also you can be trans and not have gender dysphoria. So you've got to do the diagnosis. And then you also have to say that if they have any other mental or physical health problems, they are well managed. What does that mean? For some people, that means if they're fat, they can't get surgery because it's a poorly managed health problem to be fat. For some people, that means that they're going to screen people for conditions that they believe somebody might misinterpret as gender dysphoria, such as body dysmorphia, disordered eating, um, schizophrenia, or other conditions that might have delusional features. Is there a reason to think that people might have delusional features that are commonly misinterpreted for being trans? No, that's, it had like, there are times that people have misinterpreted delusional states as gender identities, maybe uh, in, in the medical literature, but also like who's telling that story? Why are they telling that story? How did it end up later? Unanswered questions. It's not a common problem, but we are very concerned about it being a possible problem. So there are lots of people who will try to like say that somebody shouldn't be allowed to make a decision about transitioning if they have bipolar disorder because, oh, well, maybe they're just being impulsive. But again, you don't have this level of checking and second guessing for any other surgery. If somebody wants to go have a bariatric uh, bypass surgery, nobody's going to say, oh, well, not if you're bipolar. You might, be, you might not be ready to make such an important decision like that. Somebody wants to have breast augmentation, they're not going to have that kind of layer of second guessing of like, well, can a schizophrenic person really consent to a breast augmentation? They're going to be like, does a schizophrenic person have insurance? <laughs> That's it. There's no letter for that. <laughs> so I will often ask people when I'm, when I'm talking to therapists about how they think about writing letters for trans patients who need healthcare. I ask them like, oh, well, how would you write this letter if it was for a cis person? Or how do you write letters for your cis clients? And they go, well, I've never, and I'm like, yeah, why? <laughs> Why don't you have to do this? Why have you never had to do this before? It's weird and it's bullshit. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't treat it like it's a real thing because it's not. So having gone through, how, how do they know? Who gets to know what their body is, is doing? Who gets to know what their gender is? 
um, the idea of having the wrong body and like why do we have the idea of the wrong body and, and then the idea of um, trans broken arm of like specialization to the point of complete avoidance and of only thinking about the default person. Um, also, I happened to I happen to inquire um, at my own university how many students we had who did not experience any form of likely medical discrimination. So I looked at a, a large sampling of students who participated in a, a health survey. And I asked the data folks to pull up just the students who are exempt from misogyny in medical settings, who are exempt from transphobia, who are exempt from fatphobia, who are exempt from ableism, who are exempt from um, nativity-based uh, degradations of their, their status as a knower. And I came up with about three to 5% of the, the campus. So when we talk about the basic standard patient, we're talking about an able-bodied, um, thin or non-fat white cis hat man. And on my campus, we almost don't know him. <laughs> so we're treating, we're treating these, perfect, um, these side cases as if like, oh, it's just, it's a, this specialized kind of expert knowledge. And like, it's so, it's so weird. And like, it, it's this distancing and it's like, but the weird cases are virtually everyone. So how can we not be talking about that? How can that not be at the center of how we think about other people? Um, so we've got 10 minutes left and I wanna make sure that there's time for questions. So, um, yeah, uh, both in the, the chat and uh, in the room. Um, chat has been pretty quiet, but people do appear to be there. Cool. Um, do any of you have uh, questions about any of this material or anything related? I have a couple of questions also, but I don't want to. So I'll just go ahead and ask one thing. This is pretty basic, but I just, at one point you mentioned the trans tipping point of the 2010s, mm -hmm. right? I was wondering if you could say more about what that is. Yeah. Just to sort of, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Um, I, think, I think Time Magazine kind of announced this. Um, let, me, let me just Google this really quick. I'm also willing to Google things on your behalf if you want. So the, the tipping point um, is actually an epistemic tipping point. So yes. this, this theoretically happened in May of 2014. Um, and the concept of this is that because Laverne Cox, um, America knows about trans people now and there's no going back from it. Uh, theoretically, there have actually been a number of previous transgender tipping points that we don't remember. I think there was one in 1994 as well that the advocate was like, it's the year of trans people and America knows about trans people and there's no coming back from it. Um, there was also one in the 20s, 30s. Uh, that will definitely be in Transgender History by Susan Stryker, which is a phenomenal book. Um, but the concept is that it is the tipping point from um, the average American does not know about trans people, but if they knew they would like them to a different thing. Um, Unclear what. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely has a lot to do with know, knowing about, um, but it also has a lot of Im implicit information about like acceptance of, it's a very optimistic claim. Um, and there were then in 2017, uh, as we've had phenomenal backlash after the tipping point, which all, all trans advocates knew was going to happen. Uh, there were a bunch of like follow-up articles, like what happened to the tipping point? I thought it was supposed to be cool now. Um, 
And of course, like every year since the tipping point, there have been more and more anti-trans bills uh, in state legislatures across the country. Uh, I think this year we had 200. Um, and every year, I think every year has been more deadly than the last as well in terms of, um, of fatal violence against trans people. And this year, the youngest trans person killed in the US was 13. So um, it was not a good year. So yeah, the, I think that the tipping point, um, the tipping point is, is theoretically this really optimistic moment of like, trans people have blossomed into public life and everything's cool now. Um, and what, what actually happened was like a moment of epistemic rupture uh, that we are continuing to negotiate. Um, and where a lot of the negotiations are violent, uh, there, there's a lot happening in terms of like trying to control that narrative. And in the past, um, particularly in Nazi Germany, the way to disrupt um, the presence of trans people in the German imagination was physically destroying texts and arresting scholars who tried to propagate that information. I think that that is not as available as a solution to current fascists because the internet makes that much more complicated. Um, it is hard to destroy a library uh, right now. I've got two on me. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that looks different now. The attempts to destroy information just do not do not take exactly the same form as they did in the 1930s and 40s. But, um, but yeah, so there, there's, there's a lot of um, active contention around trans people in schools and trans people in public spaces, which I think is expressive of a desire to, uh, to push back on um, what is perceived to be this like epistemic encroachment on the white, heterosexual family. Yeah. Um, so you said that like you don't have to be fully knowledgeable and educated in order to like get involved and not be an asshole. Maybe you just want to talk more about that. Sure. Um this is something that this is something that I think I see a lot of working in universities that often the model that people are working from is kind of this idea that like if if you say or do something that is morally wrong along the lines of stereotyping or discrimination or um, making this sort of uh, that sort of moral wrong um, must be grounded in ignorance. And I think that some of the things that that does is A, makes us be not critical enough to people with PhDs who are still very capable of moral wrong. Um, I think it, it creates a way of negotiating wrongdoing that is really ineffective in terms of community relations. Um, that like not knowing is a relevant reason for making a mistake or making a particular choice, but often it gets leveraged as like, I didn't know, therefore gotcha. Like you can't be mad because I didn't know. And you see that dynamic of like, teach me, teach me, I'm here to learn and thus you have to drop what you're doing to teach me. Um, and if you don't choose to do that, then really aren't you the asshole? <laughs> and so I think that like the way that, that ignorance gets used in terms of um, demographic-based injustice is often really unhelpful, both like as people who want to do better. And it can just be really frustrating to also be wronged by somebody and have them kind of pull that like, oh, now you have to teach me. Like you've unlocked the next stage of this, <laughs> which is more interaction with me, um, while also like not taking seriously their responsibility. And I think that, um, I, I have a paper that's drafted right now, actually, that, that introduces or um, that engages with the, the concept of the duty to know. 
uh, where there's there's basically no evidence um, that involuntarily hospitalizing somebody who's mentally ill is a good idea. Um, there are so many studies about ways that it harms people, and there's virtually no evidence for any kind of benefit. Um, almost nobody who enacts involuntary hospitalization knows that, because if they knew, they would probably feel more ambivalent and maybe like push back. And so that information is not disseminated. It is available. It is highly, like it's it's high quality. It is like top of the, the epistemic hierarchy, like, uh, you know, meta-analysis and, and reviews and like high, high level studies. Um, so it could be valued knowledge within medicine, but it's not it's not engaged with. Um, and so people don't have to have any feelings about what they're doing because they don't know, but they could know and they should know. And so there's a sense of like, well, if you're in a position to enact immediate carceral power over somebody's life, isn't it kind of on you to know whether that's good? Um, you already have at that point, a master's degree or a PhD, you already know how to access these sources. You know that theoretically your work should be grounded in evidence. If you've never seen the evidence that supports the thing that you're doing, why was there ever a moment where you thought it was okay to do it? Um, I think that that is unfortunately a lot clearer cut of an example than things that happen in like everyday conversations. But everyday conversations don't kill people usually. So. Um, a higher standard, clearer case, um, higher stakes. So I think that thinking about things in terms of if I just get enough knowledge um, will often put us in a position to make those kind of mistakes in terms of not actually being accountable for errors. Um, and there's kind of a balance between like, I can't know everything. Sometimes I will not know something and it'll cause me to do harm to somebody else. And there's kind of a like, them's the breaks internally. Like you won't know enough to stop you from ever hurting another person. Sometimes you will just get it wrong. And being prepared to just hold that without having to evaluate like, where am I as a knower in this moment? Like just, just be a doer in that moment. Like, just like, yeah, this is what happens and that's awful and I'm so sorry. Um, and I think that that'll all ultimately put us in a position to be in a more good faith and accountable place versus that position of trying to know enough to have the status. And then you're not, you're also not getting like, I'm sure you've seen, you've seen this where it's like, don't you know who I am? <laughs> where like the two, the two responses that are in the knower uh, identity uh, in terms of like having harmed somebody is either I don't know anything, I, I'm nothing, teach me, or I actually know a lot. So is it really harmful if I know so much? And both of those suck. Um, neither of them are reparative, neither of them are accountable, um, and neither of them actually lead to knowing more things. So even if your goal is to know things, like neither of those is useful that way. Yeah, so we're out of time, but also I want to ask a quick follow-up question. I don't think there's anyone who comes in here immediately after, so you have to take um, What would a reparative approach to that sort of fight, conflict, or whatever look like? Um, yeah, um, I, I want to concretize this so that it's not just, um, can you give me an example of a time that, yeah, goodness. Uh, that somebody made an ignorant mistake? Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, I'm, that's not functioning right now yet. Um, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily need to ask, like, can you walk us through that? I just mean more something like, um, I think we've identified a, cert, a sort of tension, or there's, there's kind of two tensions. There's one that's like the approach to this 
that frames everything in terms of like having enough knowledge one way or the other is not the correct approach, right? Yeah. Uh, for the reasons that we just said. There's another that's something like what the discussion about transbroken arm syndrome uh, shows us about prioritizing um, ethical action over knowledge of a certain sort, right? Um, and I was mostly just meaning to ask something like, um, what does it look like to navigate this space in that kind of? Okay, so I just I just thought of an example of somebody who I I really like as a model of, of somebody who is very sensitive to opportunities to repair. Oh, I thought of one too. It might be the same. Um, so uh, when I I had a professor when I was an undergrad <laughs> who was probably the most aware of like the vibe in the room of any professor I've ever had. Um, she could feel the wind change instantly. And she was very willing to not know what was going on. And I think that made her response really valuable because there would be moments where somebody would say something or she would say something. Um, she mispronounced a word in a way that was a bit racist one time and the whole room flinched just a tiny bit. And she instantly said, oh, that was wrong. And that was so much better than not doing that. Um, there was a time that, um, okay, so this is very much dating this content, but having said earlier, that that can be a good thing. Um, somebody in one of my classes uh, was presenting about contemporary feminism and mentioned Beyonce. And my professor said, uh, Beyonce, like Beyonce? And, the like performance had just come out that was like Beyonce standing on a stage with the word feminism in like 50 feet letter, 50 foot letters. And nobody said anything, but again, she just kind of felt it be weird. And she goes, I feel like I need to Google this. And it was like, somebody was just like, do an image search. <laughs> <laughs> and she ended up putting it into a talk later. Um, not the story, not the story of the mistake, but she mentioned Beyonce and feminism as part of an introduction to an event that was coming up where she was summarizing student research. And so it called back to the fact that she had been wrong without spotlighting it, without being like, oh, I was wrong and it was terrible and I hope everyone forgives me. But it showed that she hadn't just like moved away from it. You know, she was interested in the knowledge, but she also, like she was more interested in being in relationship than she was interested in being right at the moment. And she kept showing up in that same way where she was willing to be caught flat-footed and look like she didn't know what she was talking about by just saying like, oh, I'm the one who doesn't know what I'm talking about because all 20 of you are looking at me like I'm wrong and I trust that. <laughs> and I think like that energy is really powerful and there's also a balance to be reached. Like you don't want to just be like, I, I don't have to ever actually think about things as long as I'm good enough at apologizing, but just being present, just noticing like, oh, we are suddenly having less fun. Did the thing happen? Does somebody want to tell me what the thing was? I think like that is, that's good. That, that brings a lot. Um, and I think it's even more true within institutional relationships um, where there is, a built-in epistemic hierarchy between the two people. So that's awesome for a professor to do towards students. It's awesome for a, a provider to do toward a patient, um, where instead of saying like, I am the guy who knows all the stuff and you're the learned person, they're like, oh, I, I missed a thing, what happened? Um, I think that is a really, really good way of humanizing the person who's in that subordinate role. Are there any like, one last thing, questions before we head out? Um, nothing in the chat. Awesome. Um, do you want to put my email? Yeah, absolutely. It's just my last name at UCSB. All right. Oh, gosh, what um, okay. I did not see how you spelled that. Was it? I looked it up. Okay, great. I Googled it. Excellent. <laughs> um, I spelled it wrong first.
that Ashley must know. Um, okay, so uh, just your name, my last name, your last name okay. at UCSB. So um, if anybody comes up with questions uh, later or ask questions about my work or you forgot to write down one of these books and you want to know what it is, um, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm a little bit slow to respond to email, but I will respond. Yeah.